Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, so welcome to today's session. So we're going to be giving you an overview of and a, very much an introduction to surveying reptiles and amphibians. And while this is um, suitable for all, you know, anybody across the UK and, and hopefully uh, beyond, um, this uh, these sessions are um, hosted by the Saving Scotland's Amphibians and Reptiles Project. So we're obviously particularly keen in Scotland as the newest project to get more uh, volunteer surveyors. Um, so, yeah, so those of you who are in Scotland, um, we'd love to hear from you. But also there's lots of opportunities, of course, across the UK. So just to introduce you to the SAR team. Um, so my name's Rachel and I'm the Scotland coordinator uh, based in uh, Glen Devon. Um, and Janet Ullman, my partner in crime, is our education officer. So she's based in Loch Elsh, um, but works um, across uh, the central and and the high, and highlands um, as well, doing lots of um, uh, community engagement and working with schools um, and a, an adoption pond scheme. And I'm joined today as a co-trainer is uh, John Wilkinson. So he's our regional um, lead for Scotland and Wales. He's also our UK um, training and science programme manager. So I'm going to start today with an introduction to surveying reptiles um, and then we'll have some questions and then I'll hand over to John for the amphibian part of today. So just as a starting point, there's lots of different ways that you can get involved um, in helping to for us to better understand the state of the UK's herps. Um, so very much from sort of helping get incidental records um, to taking part in uh, Dragon Watch, which is very much a garden uh, uh, focused um, survey, um, but also then getting involved in our national amphibian survey and national monitoring survey. And for those of you lucky enough to be in areas where there's nest jack toads um, as well, you can get involved with that. Um, so uh, a great way to, to get started is actually to upload your records to Record Pool. So if you're um, walking out and about um, and you come across some incidental records, um, I will make sure that these are popped into the, the chat, but also we'll be sending the slides around so you have all of these links um, as well. So today in this session, we're going to be covering sort of your, your pre-survey considerations, um, thermoregulation, and looking at some examples of some really good uh, reptile habitats. And then of course, then diving into um, our sort of reptile survey methods, and we'll then send a link for more information. And so looking at kind of when we're gonna be surveying and the different types of survey um, that you can take part in. And um, but first of all, we just wanna kick off with uh, um, the sort of uh, licensing and legislation. So Natterjack toads, uh, great crested newts, Pool frog, sand lizard, and smooth snakes are all European protected species. And as such, you need to have a um, EU license to, to take part. So that is um, given by the statutory authorities. Um, for those of you who um, are working under an ARCS license, um, we can work with you um, to, to get some licenses as well. Um, so certainly we have volunteers who are covered in Scotland on our, our Great Crested Newt um, license. So all of these species are fully protected and the, the surveys are, you know, considered a disturbance um, to the species. And so it is really important that people get appropriate training. Um, and so you do need to have a license for that. And also there's a reporting obligation to everybody who has a license to ensure you upload your reports to your uh, statutory authority, or you can do that if you're an ARC volunteer through, through our GIS team. And then across the UK, all um, reptiles are UK protected species. So that um, means that they are uh, protected against any intentional injury, killing or sale. And that is um, under the Schedule 5 uh, Wildlife and Countryside Act of 1981 that's been uh, as amended. So there's no uh, reporting obligation uh, when you're surveying these species, but obviously from our perspective, wanting to understand the state of um, our sort of herps, uh, we really are, you know, want to kind of know uh, that information. So all reptiles are biodiversity action plan species or BAP species, um, along with um, common toad. Um, and just to say that there's also um, 
the JNCC requ regulations and requirements for triple SIs, so sites of scientific interest, um, adder and uh, common toad on now actually trigger species um, that so it's it's really great if you can report them if they are in triple SIs. So as John always likes to say, this is the, the, the get the boring parts out of the way, but, uh, you know, a very uh, important um, to, for you to ensure that you are taking care of your health and safety. Um, so obviously um, kind of know where you're, you're going. A lot of times people get on site and then kind of, you know, move around to quite different locations. Um, and they sometimes, you know, don't exactly know where they're going and they haven't um, had a you know good look at the site before they start. So it's really important to carry out a risk assessment um, beforehand and um, and also to consider whether you're doing a day or night um, visit. So if you are going to go at night, ensure that you do your risk assessment and your site visit in the daytime beforehand. And identify um, any hazards on your route, um, you know, as part of your assessment. But of course, that you can also then double check when you're when you're there in case anything has changed. And ideally, if you can, and it's not always possible, but it is really good to, if you can have a survey buddy to go out and about with just in case anything happens. Um, but if that's not possible, um, then just ensure that you agree check-in times with somebody, um, usually somebody at home who knows when you're going to be out and about, um, and they have the contact details of, of maybe the, the farm or the location that you're going to be um, surveying at. And of course, always carry a mobile phone. We've all been caught out maybe where our phones have died. Uh, so make sure that your phone is fully charged up. And for those of you doing um, surveys around ponds, um, put it into a waterproof uh, bag as well, just in case you have a little slip and trip. Um, and then some other kind of considerations, obviously the general safety of the area you need to be thinking about. Are you kind of safe on site? Is there anything um, you know, and if you feel unsafe at any point to obviously stop the survey, your health and safety comes first. Um, and also consider if you might have adders in the area. So ensuring extra precaution to keep yourself safe um, from adder bites um, and also any other uh, medical issues. So, of course, being very mindful as well of the weather. And as we know, uh, certainly for those of you in Scotland, it changes quite considerably. Um, so you need to obviously take in consider it could be get really cold, um, but it could also get, you know, pretty, pretty hot. So just being mindful um, that, that you take care. And of course, the terrain um, can be quite an issue. So certainly if you're on kind of quite rough ground um, and steep ponds as well and other animals. So often sometimes livestock can be a bit of an issue. Um, I've definitely been, I heard a stampede of some uh, bullocks when I was doing a survey one night um, and that was pretty, pretty scary. So just uh, to um, make sure that you are mindful if there are livestock and just obviously ensure that you discuss that with the, the, the land manager if there's any animals to be concerned about. And of course, there could be other site hazards. So there could be sort of vehicles, um, bikes, um, also during the shooting season, just to also be um, wary of that. And of course, broken glass as you're walking around as well. And um, yeah, always get permission um, to visit the site um, and, um, and also consider insurance. So if you are um, a signed up as an ARC volunteer, you will be covered by ARC's insurance, but if you aren't, um, just to be mindful, um, that is definitely a consideration. So um, thermoregulations uh, is obviously a, an important um, consideration because all reptiles are obviously driven uh, by the temperature and weather and want to kind of uh, warm up. So this obviously thermoregulation drives uh, reptile behavior. And so that kind of gives us good clues as to where we can spot reptiles. Um, and so reptiles really like a variable structure. So a mosaic vegetation um, where you've kind of got, you know, sort of bare ground and some bolt holes as well so that they can kind of be quite safe. So they really like basking um, and bare ground. And obviously that ground will warm up um, really a lot quicker um, as well. Um, and also um, south facing, so any kind of um, embankments um, and bare ground that's south facing is, is also a, a really good area to look for. 
Um, and also the topography having a lot that's quite kind of undulating. So there will be those sort of, um, you know, kind of warmer spots and, and microclimates amongst um, the, the different um, sort of landscapes as well. And this is a, a really nice example of a lowland heath um, kind of area. So you can kind of see um, in this picture, you know, some some areas that are you know kind of not as dense so there's obviously it's, it's a lot safer for animals to be able to actually shoot into dense vegetation if they are disturbed um, but also there's some nice um, areas that they can bask um, along as well um, and this is also another good example of some moorland um, with some gorse scrub as well so you know again kind of undulating kind of habitat and different areas where there's you know, sort of gaps in the vegetation and um, where the animals can bask, but also areas that they can, you know, kind of escape if they want to, to move away from people. And here's a nice picture as well of some kind of moorland um, and heathland bog, um, so especially in the summer. So also thinking, of course, um, as well as sort of basking requirements, but also um, food availability as well will be a big driver. And, at, you know, sites, if you're walking along and you come across sites like this, um, which could be, you know, fantastic um, basking habitat as well, but also would attract insects um, and other species. So um, it's always good to kind of have a look um, for as well. And, and also, again, this is a great um, uh, place for animals to, to be quite protected and to be able to hide amongst as well. And, you know, certainly from a basking perspective as well there's kind of a lots of vegetated kind of uh, cliffs and dune systems are a really fantastic way to to have a look um especially kind of you know some of these areas near the, the denser vegetation but you can see that there's some quite a lot of areas of of nice uh bare ground um as well lots of lovely sunshine also tussocky or kind of rough grassland um, can be a really good place to look, especially at the sort of the um, you know um, field margins. So again, um, you might have your your reptiles kind of basking in the margins, but there's also those tussocky areas that they can kind of bolt to um, as needed. And linear features are always really good. Um, so railways and road verges are a great um, place to look for reptiles. Um, obviously, kind of with health and safety requirements, um, a lot of uh, railway lines you wouldn't be able to access. Um, but it's a really good opportunity to have a look at, at um, habitats, um, you know, adjacent to these sites because they can be really handy um, as well. And for those of you who are in areas with uh, grass snake um, as, as egg layers, these are fantastic sites to kind of have a look at. Um, so these big manure piles are really nice and warm um, for uh, the grass snake to, to lay their eggs in. So it's a really good, and slow worm, it's a really good uh, to have a look uh, for these sites and also for slow worm, of course, in other you know, smaller compost heaps as well. And of course, allotments are a fantastic um, place as well, especially if there's um, some plots that have been left overgrown or there's some kind of uh, more dense vegetation at the side of uh, the allotments. And brownfield sites are absolutely fantastic for reptiles. Um, so, um, you know, kind of you've got this sort of open habitat, but there's actually quite a lot of, uh, you know, rubble and discarded potential refugia. Um, so we'll be talking about that a little bit later, but lots of also nice basking areas on the bare ground um, and areas that they could kind of um, also have, have protection and cover from as well. So we're gonna just talk about the sort of general reptile um, surveying methods, but as I've mentioned, we'll also put a link into the chat um, about the monitoring program, which goes into these uh, the surveying methods in a lot more detail. So this is just very much an introduction uh, to get you started. So obviously we're kind of wanting to look at the best time of year to maximize your, um, your time and uh, the chances of seeing your reptiles. So the best time of year um, to start is in spring. Obviously, it might depend where you're based. Um, and if you're not, um, like as we had last year or the year before, kind of in Scotland covered in snow still. Um, so, but generally at spring time, kind of from April onwards is a really good time um, to start your surveying. Um, so you're wanting to obviously maximize when reptiles are most active and visible. 
um, and um, getting into sort of breeding condition as well. And so when there's cooler weather, they need to bask um, for longer. Um, so then that's actually quite a nice opportunity for you to be able to actually see them um, and to get a good um, you know, view of you know, being able to take a photo or get a you know, better um, surveying, you know, getting your eye into the survey. Um, and, you know, as spring becomes summer, surveying only possible in short times because it's actually very warm. And so your reptiles are going to bolt much easier as soon as they kind of feel your vibration. So once they're really warmed up, they've really frost. Um, so it's actually a lot harder um, to, to spot them in time. Um, and then as uh, the sort of cooler uh, autumn temperatures arrive, again, um, the survey conditions could could improve uh, depending on, on the conditions and the, um, where you're based. So this is um, just to give you a bit of an oversight in kind of the general um, so best times of year to, sur to survey. So, um, you know, generally, um, across the UK in uh, January, February, November and March is, um, you know, kind of peak hibernation time. And of course, this could actually extend further, as I sort of mentioned, if you, you know, if you're, uh, depending on the further north we are, if it's colder, um, that could obviously extend. And equally, um, you know, it could be that um, animals go into hibernation slightly earlier in October as well. Um, so the second um uh, line here just gives you an overview of the general activity levels um, of reptiles um, and then you've got your sort of um, peak courtship and mating times um, you know particularly sort of May is a really good time um, and then of course from July onwards the sort of birth or hatching of of young so you know kind of bearing that with that in mind you know it wouldn't be good to kind of go out in January or December, although from February in some areas, um, you know, certainly kind of adders could be coming out of hibernation. Um, but as we sort of mentioned before, April is a really good time to to do your surveying um, effort. July can be quite variable. Um, again, as we'd mentioned, because it can be quite warm, it can actually be quite poor conditions and it's quite difficult, um, but it really just depends on the weather conditions. And again, October could be a, a really good time to, to get out there as well and get some good sightings. So, you know, early spring is, is quite good and because the temperatures are a bit cooler and there's a lot of more variation in the time of day. So obviously you don't want to go too early when it's still quite cold, um, but you have quite a widespread from sort of around 11 a.m. Um, to 3 p.m. is generally, you know, quite a good time to go. Um, and then in late spring, kind of mid morning, um, so kind of getting out that sort of slightly earlier uh, times or later afternoon. So you're avoiding the you know, hotter kind of lunchtime peak here. Um, and then in summer, even earlier again, so you want to be getting out um, from seven onwards or you can again kind of go out in, in the evenings. It's quite a nice time as well. Um, and, you know, often, you know, if you're going out in really hot, conditions you can just get no results um because the the reptiles will be incredibly uh fast and shoot away um so you won't see anything um and then autumn can be quite similar to springtime again depending on the conditions and of course the time of day um will vary with the, the weather as well um so it just depends on your location so this is just a a, a very rough guide So that's what, and uh, yeah, so you also in, in as well as the temperature, we don't want to be going out when there's kind of really um, strong winds um, or uh, kind of heavy rains. Um, but any other kind of conditions can be good um, depending on the, the time of year. So it's more kind of really the temperature dependent um, is what I would sort of consider. Um, so you want to be doing your surveys in sort of 10 to 20 degrees um, and it might be slightly cooler in Scotland, but around there would be ideal. Um, and as we sort of mentioned, kind of late spring and autumn, um, you know, it can, you know, depending on the sun uh, temperature or cloud cover, um, you know, you, you might actually be quite lucky in, in getting, um, you know, reptiles out basking for slightly longer when those weather conditions are a bit cooler. 
um, and sunshine after rain is ideal. So I always think that reptile surveys actually mean we, we, we all go out at really nice <laughs> with nice conditions. So it's a great uh, one to get involved in. Um, and also um, the first sunshine after sort of dull uh, overcast weather, you know, reptiles will be really keen to be kind of warming up and getting more active. So that's a really great time for you to get out and about. Um, and extended sort of periods of very hot weather, um, you know, just w wouldn't be good uh, to go out um, and you wouldn't, you'd probably come up with uh, very little, if, if any, results during that time. So when you're actually surveying for reptiles, you should ideally, if you can, combine two different um, techniques. So the first one is, um, you know, you could be doing like a walk transect and doing a visual search. So you're just um, spending time just stopping and having, a, you know, a look with uh, binoculars. Um, but also a, a really good method to increase your chances of getting uh, reptile records is actually to using artificial refugia. Um, and, you know, all species can be found during, uh, during, you know, using visual search. It just depends on the survey effort and the time taken to do that. Um, but artificial refugia, as I sort of mentioned, really increases your chances, particularly for, for some species that are a bit shyer and harder to, to, to spot. Um, and also, of course, you, you would combine these two. So even if you're searching for refugia, you want to be actually looking for, um, you know, doing your kind of searching as you're going between your refugia points. And of course, practice, um, as with everything, really helps. So, you know, don't be disheartened if you go out and it does take a little while to get your eye in and to, to actually start doing it. But just, just you know, keep keep going. So for visual searching, you're kind of wanting to be doing, you know, quite a slow walk, um, you know, scanning your kind of sunny sides of the vegetation, those kind of bare ground um, or kind of, you know, uh, lighter vegetation sites. Um, you want to keep the sun behind you or to your side so you're not shading. Um, you want to kind of tune your eye into the vegetation interface. So, you know, really take that time to kind of stop and, and have a really good search. Um, and, you know, really spend a lot of time at those sort of areas um, that reptiles are most likely to be um, basking along. So particularly along the sort of edges and, and bare grounds. Um, and as we sort of have seen in those pictures, you know, it's actually seldom that they're very far away from dense cover just the, for their own protection. So, you know, if you've got these really nice kind of areas that look great for basking and they're quite close, then, you know, do take a bit more time in those areas. So for those of you who might know uh, Trevor Rose, this is a picture of Trevor. So he's uh, giving a good example of, you know, where to spot. So you can kind of see, you know, all around here, this, this sort of quite dense uh, vegetation, but there's some, you know, nice little spots in here. And that's exactly where you want to be, to be looking right in there. Um, you know, so just to kind of give you another angle of that, you know, kind of, you know, you can see from here that there's some really good vegetation that your reptile could spot in, you know, dash into. So, of course, if it is very warm, they are going to just go in there. But we are looking for these kind of, you know, really sheltered spots that are kind of nice sun traps. So also, as you can see from the cluster of vegetation around, this will also be quite protected from, you know, wind as well. And so be, you know, nice um, warm microclimates. So. Also, kind of just to touch on sort of artificial refugia, there are different kinds um, and kind of the most uh, sort of, I suppose, best method has been considered uh, corrugated metal. Um, but quite often um, people use um, roofing felt, which is, you know, lighter um, and easier to, to take out. So that is also um, often, you know, corrugated metal is fantastic, um, but it can be, you know, it's quite heavy to, to carry. So um, that's your pros and cons. Um, but there's actually lots of other things that can work. Um, what you're looking for is sort of something roughly about 70 by 70 centimeters um, in size, just to kind of um, have good, uh, you know, reasonable refugia size. But actually, that's also quite handy for you to carry. Um, you want to be choosing kind of sunny locations away from public view and from livestock. So just to be mindful that obviously, if you're actually, you know, People might stand on your refugia, and so that wouldn't be good if you've got reptiles underneath it. Um, but also um, livestock could stand on it as well. And also sometimes they can, for the roofing felt, can can chew on it. So do make sure um, if you're 
working in a site where you've got permission that you just let the land manager know what you'll be using. Um, and what you want to do is to basically press um, your refugia down um, close to the ground. Um, so you want it quite close to so that, that deep cover, um, but you want to have it in the edges of the vegetation, um, but you don't want it near any sort of uh, bare ground. Um, so you want it to start to really bed in um, so the reptiles can get underneath. Um, and it takes about two weeks or so for them to bed in. So that's also, you know, just worth bearing in mind to put them out ahead of your survey. Um, but also just to be mindful when you're lifting up, particularly for corrugated um, metal um, and, and kind of replacing, just to be really careful um, that you're not squishing kind of any um, animals that are underneath there. And if you're in an area uh, where there are adders, so just to make sure you use a stick to lift up your refugia so you don't give um, an adder a bit of a fright. So they are incredibly shy um, animals and so they will bolt as if wherever they can. Um, but of course, if we catch them unawares and give them a bit of a fright, um, so do use a stick um, or you can also get some adder-proof gloves um, to ensure your safety. And so this is just a, a picture of um, some bedded in uh, refugia. So this is kind of tins or corrugated um, uh, metal sheets that have um, been, been quite well bedded in here. Um, and then also you can get um, underline. And so this is a uh, also corrugated, so it's really quite good, but it's, it isn't as heavy, um, but also has had some really good results, same as the corrugated um, uh, metal, as I've mentioned. Um, and then this is the kind of roofing felt. So you'll have seen this on kind of sheds. Uh, so you can buy this in um, in, a, in a roll. So again, this hasn't been um, bedded in yet. So this has just been put out, but just, you know, kind of make sure you kind of stamp it down at the corners um, and, and it will bed in um, over time. Um, and so just to give you sort of a bit of a, you know, when you're kind of going out and trying to look at where you're going to start your surveying, you know, you want to think about, you know, kind of, um, you know, some nice sort of uh, sun exposed um, insulation sort of area. So you want to have somewhere that's going to be quite warm. Um, so you want to look at your kind of aspect ratio. You want to have a look at a slope, um, kind of also the shade level. So you don't want areas that are going to be really shady. So if you've got lots of tree uh, cover um, and you want to make sure that there's some nice um, vegetation structure, as you can see from here, you've got some, you know, kind of, uh, you know, really quite dense um vegetation and then you've got some nice tussocky grass and then a few areas of, of bare ground um so uh the vegetation um you know kind of underneath sort of uh you know the the bare ground is too far too exposed from from the um the the dense vegetation and the really uh, taller tussocky areas um so you want to have it somewhere here you also want to have it if you're putting your refuge down to make sure that it is safe um, and away from people um, pets and livestock so um, you know this uh, image here just gives you an idea of you know this is a, a really good place that you would you know kind of could put down some refugia or do your visual um, survey so um, as we sort of mentioned just very briefly you know kind of takes about two weeks for the refugia to um, to bed in um, so allow um, you know a good time um, for, for your reptiles to be attracted to, to the new refugia going in. Um, and obviously you want to go out again when there's good weather conditions. Um, ensure you create a, a refuge map so that, you know, it's easy kind of when you, you know, when you go and first put it down at the start of spring, it looks all really easy to find. But as the vegetation comes up, we've all been caught out when we've gone out and, and not quite sure exactly where it is. So it is really good to have that GPS um, location um and also always search in between so although you want to spend you know it's you know you're probably likely going to get most of your uh species occurrence data from the refugia but actually in between as well it's really good for you to spend a bit of time looking um and if the vegetation all dies underneath it so sometimes you kind of also get you know lots of ant ants uh, ant mounds um under there so you just want to um, move it along so you can just you know move it um right next next door um and uh and then just uh you know kind of again leave, give it a bit of time to to bed in and of course you know the more refugia you have um, down so the higher your density you're going to increase uh the detection rates and particularly for juveniles because 
the refugia is really nice um to to warm up and i actually should have said um before that you know the refugia of course sometimes the reptiles will go underneath it but often they'll sit on top because it's nice and warm so also just to be mindful as you're approaching to kind of have a quick look before you get too close as well and again you know take your binoculars out with you um, but also sometimes you just um, hit a bit of a bit of luck um, with, you know, people uh, dumping things um, and uh, you might come across, you know, um, like this piece of wood. So actually, this is a really good um, you know opportunity for you to have a look at refugia that's actually already in place. Um, but again, just be very mindful, especially if something is quite heavy to lift it up fully and um, to not kind of tip it to the side because actually you, there could be something underneath that you could then uh, crush um, and obviously then to make sure everything has been moved to the side before you lay it back down. Um, and I'm just going to uh, pause here very quickly if there's any questions and hand over to John. Thank you very much. It's okay, we, we can take more questions later. So moving on to survey for amphibians now. Um, there are some additional pre-survey considerations, uh, but we'll look at egg searching, torching, netting, uh, and we will mention bottle trapping, but we're not covering that today because it's a more advanced technique that requires uh, more practice for people to be able to use it. And of course, with great crested news, you couldn't possibly do that without a license. Those are our aquatic methods. And I'll just mention briefly refuge searching, which you can also use for amphibians. A useful thing I always like to tell people about for doing amphibian surveys is to follow the rule of two. So if you're doing a visual search, you would search a pond bank two meters and then move on to the next two meters before recording anything else there. Similarly, with torching and netting, it's always done in two meter sections and it helps you divide up the pond and make sure you haven't missed anything. So unfortunately, ponds, all ponds should be regarded as a potential source of disease for you, I mean. Um, so don't immerse cuts. Uh, we don't recommend eating or smoking or drinking around your pond while you're surveying. And you can sometimes wear suitable gloves when needed and of course, Either way, always wash your hands after surveying, especially if you're handling pond vegetation, uh, muddy nets, etc. Health and safety, as always, is a primary consideration. So if you're doing night survey, torching, always visit the pond beforehand to assess the risks, uh, the risks being similar to the ones Rachel's discussed, for example. And lastly, consider your impact on the pond when you're doing a survey because ponds can get trashed uh, quite easily uh, when those are done. Let me just get rid of that notification. Um, and of course, another impact you can have is on the amphibians themselves. So amphibians are globally in decline. There aren't any non-endangered amphibians apart from some of the invasive ones in places where they shouldn't. Disease is a very much a contributory factor. Um, those include things you might have heard of, like the chytrid fungus. There's now two varieties of that. And things like red leg, which people often see in common frogs in their garden ponds and causes local die-offs. Uh, so we have to advise people to change or clean equipment during surveys between all ponds more than one kilometre apart. The reason that figure is put on that is that basically amphibians can move by themselves between ponds that are less than one kilometre apart. So that's to be a guide, and that's the guideline. You may want to clean your vehicle tyres if you park them somewhere wet by the pond. You would certainly clean your nets and equipment and your boots, especially, and clothing if it gets wet or muddy. Be especially wary of any pond sites you know have got non-native species present because they're more likely to have one of the diseases that can affect our native species. In terms of how you keep your equipment and clothes, etc. clean, um, the easiest thing to do, honestly, is veterinary disinfectants. You can use a beach spray, but you find that your nets and your boots fall apart more quickly if you do that. So it um, can be more practical in some circumstances. But if you do it all the time, 
be changing their equipment very often. And of course, making sure you adhere to security guidelines helps present all the problems, spreading other things between ponds, such as non-native plants, which is very, very easy to do with just a small piece of vegetation stuck to your net, for example. This is the veterinary disinfectant that we recommend. It's used for all sorts of things. Uh, you might think it's a bit of a stretch, but actually you can buy tablets of this Vercon S very easily on eBay and indeed from other suppliers quite cheaply. So just to say that that's what we use and it's not as much of a, an onerous thing that you might think. So survey methods. Um, egg searching is uh, where we would start with any survey once you've done your preliminary visit to the pond to the health and safety etc you could regard this as a more general visual search but we we pick on egg searching because you want to do that before um, any other methods are used to minimize disturbance and of course we're looking here at a new tag folded into a leaf they're just under the surface of the water on submerged vegetation. If you've got a license, you can have a good peer at them to see what species they are. So they're the ones that great crested newts, which are licensable, as you know, and darker grayish ones are smooth and palmate newts. Now, although we've unwrapped some eggs here just to demonstrate what they look like, you can often just peer into the gap where the leaf is folded over to determine the colour of the egg so you don't need to disturb the egg that much and even if you do feel you need to unwrap you can actually wrap it back up again and make sure it's submerged under the water when you've finished so we're trying to minimise our impact on the pond and the species here just to show oh, you to disturb you John a couple of people are just struggling with the sound um, quality but I think it might just be your internet but it looks like it's back to normal um, but yeah just to maybe talk a bit louder if you can. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll project. So um, these are just examples of uh, places where newts have laid their eggs. It's very easy to spot, at least, that there are newt eggs there. Sometimes so many newts lay their eggs on a plant that actually they they that there isn't any leaves left for them to fold over. So the ones you can see exposed are great crested newts. Here and these are some of the typical plants that they like. Uh, for example, on the left is gypsy wort, and bottom right is water mint. They're two favourite plants for newts to lay their eggs on. Your visual search or your egg search uh, is also a good opportunity to look for frog and toad spawn a little earlier in the year, perhaps the newts. Frog spawns always in clumps, toad spawns always in strings. If you are in an area where there are natterjacks and you're interested in doing natterjack surveys, one of the things you'll be asked to do is to count new spawn strings and you can identify natterjack spawn because of its single row of eggs rather than a double row that you get with common toads uh, in uh, the spawn of water. <laughs> But, but I suspect the DWNP stuff and that's what... Looking at um, different advantages between the different survey methods, um, wool searching or egg searching, it can be quite quick. You can count the strings. You can detect the presence of new species. You don't need any equipment. And as long as you're responsible, there's a low level of disturbance. But you can't determine the population sizes of newts by egg searching because a female newt might lay say 300 eggs if you have 300 eggs you might have one or you, you might have equally 300 so we don't actually advise counting eggs it's completely pointless and of course you can't in any way discriminate between smooth and palmate newts. but other than that there are advantages just to going out and having a look and you can use binoculars to search areas further out from the bank of the pond as well. On to torching now. I'm going to say this is our preferred method for establishing population sizes of newts. Because, of course, amphibians are primarily nocturnal. You can detect the species and 
with good access to the pond, it allows you to count how many you've got. It's best from March to May, sometimes a little bit earlier. Certainly in recent years, great crested newts have been found in the pond a lot earlier, sometimes over winter all the time. And you need really warmish, still evenings. Um, you won't see as much amphibian activity in a cold, rainy night, uh, because rather like us, they prefer it to be warm and calm. But also detection of the species you're looking for is also more difficult when it's raining. So avoid wind, rain or very low temperatures, which, of course, the amphibians will be doing as well. As I say, torch in two metre sections, telling the adult scene. And of course, uh, any daytime survey work should occur, should occur prior to torching so that potential hazards can be identified in the daylight. And that excludes, of course, netting, which disturbs the pond. The survey standard for amphibians is a rather amazingly million candle power torch. That's uh, the kind the professional ecologist use on the right there, DB2 clue light. They can cost a lot of money, but I always feel obliged to say, especially because at one time I was a poor student and couldn't afford anything like that, you can buy a much, much cheaper million candle power torch from EG B&Q or the DIY stores are available and they will work just as well. You might find the battery doesn't last quite as long, but if you're doing a volunteer survey, that's probably less of a factor than the cost of the torch. Lots of advantages to torching, very, very low disturbance. To be perfectly frank, if you're a newt or a toad and you get disturbed by a torch beam, as long as you're, somebody's not shining it constantly at you, you've forgotten about it about 10 minutes later. And it can be quite a quick method to detect unless you've got a very large pond uh, that you need to spend a good hour or more walking around. Of course, it has to be done in the dark, obviously, and there are therefore safety issues. And it's very much easier to survey a pond with torching if you've got a buddy to help you. So one person would be shining the torch and the other person would be perhaps tallying the amphibian scene so you get a decent count. You can't use it in all weather conditions and identification of species might be difficult from a distance, especially uh, the difference between female smooth and palmate newts, which look very similar. If the pond is very murky um, or lots of vegetation, you won't be able to survey all bits of the pond. And in those circumstances, you might need to resort to other methods such as netting. Again, a good professional net can be expensive. And again, when I was a poor student, I managed to get something suitable for a great deal cheaper than that from an angling supplier. You just need to be careful of the size of the mesh of the bag of the net, which should be about two to three millimeters so that small tadpoles, etc., don't fall through. And there's a colleague of mine who's done his back in since then doing netting. And of course, again, you work around the pond perimeter in two meter lengths. And actually the size of the net or the length of the net pole that you get usually makes that a very convenient area to survey. So you would station yourself on the bank of the pond and net through the vegetation uh, in a two meter arc before moving on, obviously recording anything that you catch. Netting in open water, if you can't actually see an amphibian there, of course, will be less effective than netting gently under and around vegetation. It can be very useful in finding newt larvae and actually, for example, generally sampling the pond to see whether it's got lots of invertebrates in it, which is good, a good example of water quality. And in a more detailed course, we might go through the habitat suitability index, which enables people to um, put a value on the health of the pond and the likelihood of finding great crested newts there. You can do netting over a long season, really March to October, when you're still finding tadpoles. And of course, you can do it in the daytime, so there are less safety risks associated with it. Your net must be sturdy, though, and you'll often miss adult great crested newts. Um, 
We've already mentioned the risk of transfer of pests and possibly diseases, hence the biosecurity advice. But the main disadvantage of netting is if it's, if it's not done carefully, you can disturb the pond to the extent that you have a negative impact. And the most obvious example of that would be heavy netting in an area that newts have chosen to lay their eggs on the vegetation. So when I take students out to practice pond survey techniques, the first thing we do before netting is a good egg search and establish the main areas where the newts are laying their eggs. And then those areas are avoided when we do our netting. Lastly, refuse searching um, is just simply looking under refugia and usually natural ones, although reptile refugia when placed in the right sort of a place uh, will also attract amphibians because sometimes they get fairly moist underneath. You're mainly looking under rocks and logs um, and discarded debris of any kind. Bits of old carpet are quite good for amphibians for some reason. Again, long season, uh, but it's a bit hit and miss. However, one training course I ran, we'd done egg searching and netting, and we were due to come back and do torching later on, but nobody had found any amphibians up to this point. And I wandered off and turned over a log and there was about 12 baby smooth newts underneath. So we knew that smooth newts were present at that pond. So it is a very, very useful supplementary technique under certain circumstances to detect species. That... And I've gone back to the log pile picture because amphibians, especially if they're here upon, amphibians will be using that to shelter. But of course, as with reptile surveys, always replace your refugia very carefully once you've looked so that you don't squash anything underneath. Rachel's already mentioned our survey and recording schemes that you can get involved in. And again, you will get these slides, so you'll get these URLs. Look out for other courses that we've got coming up, including some field taster sessions that we're going to be organising within the next two weeks around the UK. Uh, and sign up for those at our events page. And details of all the survey and monitoring schemes that Rachel has already mentioned can be found on our monitoring page, as well as protocols for the National Amphibian and National Retail Surveys that we really need volunteers for. And I think it's time for questions. So thanks very much for listening and I'll stop sharing.